I now request Dr. Rohit Chetty to give his talk on clinical applications of chromography and biomechanics in the new normal. Anybody wants to ask anything amongst the panelists? Uh, Can I start, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Amrita, ma'am, AIOS, uh, Dr. Maipal, sir, and uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, sir, and all the panelists uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to share uh, work on uh, application of uh, tomography and biomechanics. The job is made easier because uh, both Dr. Prima and uh, ma'am and uh, Dr. have explained the whole science behind it. So I'm going to talk a little different uh, today, and I'm going to speak about basically this is this is the second uh, meeting of uh, biomechanics that just shows that the amount of interest uh, it's generated. There are a lot of controversies and a lot of questions at the end of every meeting, and this is what we had last time. These are my financial interests. I don't think it has got anything to do with my presentation today. So one of the major challenges when we have uh, uh, biomechanics is uh, especially when you ma'am spoke about the SSIs and uh, all these parameters is, there are four types of it. You know, you have multiple permutation. One is everything is normal. Then the second group is your CBI is normal and your TBI is suspicious, a bad D is normal. Sometimes your CBI is normal, your this is uh, TBI is abnormal. And so basically this is what makes people believe that, well, there is no science here and people, a lot of people, clinicians think that, you know, there's no need to use this because it's not giving you anything. But both the previous speakers, uh, both uh, Professor Suzuka and uh, Prima Mam spoke about, there's a tremendous amount of mathematical modeling science here. So uh, my job today is to try to take some cases, what makes these cases completely unusual? And what are these uh, when we need to look at? And what is the real missing link? So we started looking at the real truth. Where, where is it really reading to? So what I did was instead of just sticking to just the biomechanics and the mathematical thing, I looked at multiple domain. One of the first thing which uh, is very important when to understand the whole biomechanics and what the measurement is, to trying to understand a little bit of epithelium. And uh, this is some of our papers where we spoke about how epithelium can actually mask, unmask your cornea. I'll let you know in a minute why epithelium understanding is very important in your understanding of your biomechanics, because that will give us an idea why some of your measurements sometimes don't match the way we want. And this is exactly what I said, because epithelium is here, and this is your stroma, and your biomechanics is actually measuring the stroma, not the epithelium. So how does epithelium change? Let's look at this patient. Uh, this is a suspicious topography. And you can see that the topographies are suspicious, but your indices are normal. And this is where the challenge comes. You have a posterior elevation, anterior elevation here, not much here, but your bad Ds are all normal. Your whole uh, enhanced pelin is normal. Now, what do you do with this? Now, the question is, a lot of people would say, well, I, this is where people stop believing in biomechanics. They said, well, you know what? Topography is abnormal. The bad D is showing abnormality out here close to them. That means it does not fit my pattern. Now let's play a devil's advocate. Who is right? The topography is right or the biomechanics is right? You can see that both the biomechanics and TBI are normal. So it's not, so let's see what happens. This is what is very important. This is the elevation map, which your bad D is picking up. And this is your epithelial map, which is increased here. So the patient has actually, uh, Madam said, a near normal, anything more close to a one is normal. So the patient has got a normal topography, sorry, abnormal looking topography, which is actually created by the epithelium. And biomechanics is actually telling you the truth. If there was no biomechanics in this patient, Probably what I would have done is I probably would have not done, not always people do. I do epithelial mapping, but it's not accessible to everybody. And you can see that epithelial thickness is high exactly in that zone. So this may be a person who may be sleeping with his eyes open, or he may be having exposure. But this case classically explains 
that the biomechanics was more stronger in explaining that this was a normal eye and not a keratoconic or not a form first keratoconic eye. Exactly the same thing. The, the bad D is abnormal here, but the CBI and TBI are both normal. And look at the epithelium. It's completely thick. And this look at this area, it's thicker. So that means that even though the topography can look okay, suspicious, sometimes your biomechanics actually can pick it up. And uh, we have to look at the true picture. This is one of my patients. It's a very important case to show how biomechanics is important. This was in 2010. And that time we did not have Corvus. I had the OR, ORA then 2009. So I've been seeing this patient continuously. He's a pilot, so I did not want to do a cross-linking on him. Uh, he's been stable, uh, both the eyes. But I have the serial report. But what happens is uh, the left eye is also right, both eyes stable. But because of this lockdown, he's completely indoors now because there's no planes which are flying and everybody is indoor. And look at this. This is a whole area of steepening. Now, his job is at stake. Do I go operate on him? If I operate on him, he'll lose. He'll, he can never fly again because he will have a cornea scarring, then keratoconus. This was a unilateral KC, which is maybe turning on to be a KC. Now, if I had only this, then I would probably have been a little uh, suspicious. But here, I had the lem I did confocal on him for 11 years. It's a very long time, serially. You see how the nerves are changing, and you can see that the right eye is perfectly normal. You can see the nerves. The left eye, these, what I'm circling are the dendritic cells. Dendritic cells comes when you have dry eye, when you have ocular surface inflammation. And the fantastic part of this case is I had 11 years of confocal microscopically serially done. So he is actually showing signs of a dry eye and ocular surface disease. And what has happened is because of the disease, see this. The patient, this was his uh, 2019, and this is 2020, and the epithelium has become thicker. It is epithelial hyperplasia, which matches to what is happening here. So his biomechanics, and exact same thing, you can see this whole donut shape, because when you have a very poor ocular surface, the first thing which gets affected is your epithelium. And when the epithelium gets affected, the corneal curvature changes. So what really happened was in this patient, we had his biomechanics I, because of some shuffling of slide and the biomechanics from 2014 14 to 2020 has never changed. We did not have exercise then. That means it was stable. That means that the biomechanics never changed. The cornea pro looked like progression but here, uh, what I did was I did not start him on a cross-linking. I just gave him lubricants and restasis because my confocal also showed that there's a hell of a lot of inflammation out here, which is actually creating the problem. So what is important here in this case is your PBI and CBI were normal. Your SSIs can be normal and your indices and the bad D is abnormal, but you have an inferior steepening but your SSI is also coming to normal. This is this patient is not a keratoconic patient. This patient has something to do with inflammation or epithelial remodeling, and it's not a drug. It's nothing to do with the progression. So it is very important that we look at this. And this is a classic example why people get confused with a biomechanics machine because they say, okay, if I did not look into all these things, I would have said that I don't believe in biomechanics because this looks like a keratoconus, but this is normal. And that's it. But you know what? This is normal because this is nothing to do with the, the cornea and stromites. To, it's to do with the epithelium. And uh, we did run some AI modeling on it. And AI, we have some and AI also showed that this is healthy. And it said that it's not a keratoconic picture. And this is exactly the same thing, you know, how epithelium can play a role. The second way of looking at this, we wanted to prove whether, whether we are seeing is true or false. So we built uh, our own uh, custom-made uh, polarization sensitive OCT, which looks at collagen. And this is how a collagen uh, picture is. And this is the central collagen. This is a peripheral collagen. So we started looking at different types of collagen. When you have a normal biomechanics, this is how it looks. When you have an 
when you have a see TBI is more sensitive. I agree with Professor Suzuka here because when we looked at the collagen imaging, you can see there's a dropout of collagen, and the CBI was completely normal here. That means that the collagen is collagen is showing some change. This is again one patient. When you look at this, this looks like a keratoconic picture, and you feel that is a keratoconic eye. You should be, I should. Uh, this patient had come to us with the progressive loss of vision. But look at this, CBI is normal, TBI is normal. Now, somebody would look at this and say, well, you know, this is not true because this looks keratoconic and look at the SSI is high. And what was abnormal is epithelium again. And what's interesting is this patient had a microneuroma on that. And this microneuroma was actually creating uh, epithelial irregularity and the PSOCT was normal. And uh, again, uh, some cases where uh, epithelium is norm. This how uh, the the whole map is been structured by uh, by changes happening on your epithelium and the stromal surgeries. So we wanted to do one more thing. We wanted to see whatever we are seeing. Are we see really seeing? Because each and everything, like uh, Prema Ma'am spoke and Professor Suzuka spoke, that you know you are looking at stress and strain. You are looking at collagen but you are not measuring or seeing collagen. Of course, uh, polarization OCT is one of the ways. We wanted to see, can we real time look at the collagen, image the collagen? The only time we could do is when you're doing a smile surgery, because you have a smile patient, you do a biomechanics, and the same patient's corneal tissue are going to take it out, and we can actually image the collagen in your lab. And uh, this is what we did. These were the patients where on whom we did the smile extras. Uh, and uh, you can see them changes happening. And uh, we started taking the collagen and then we started looking at the real picture. So what we did with mix of biomechanics and both the cellular biology, it, we, we were very keen on doing it because that's the only time we could prove what we are seeing. Because in the past, we looked at uh, lysol oxidase as one of the culprits. And this is a patient where uh, we had imaged it. We did this smile extra because all of them are on the suspicious zone. And we took the lenticules. We had already imaged the collagen here. And this is very interesting. When you have a poor biomechanics in this patient, the collagen is what was uh, abnormal and the lysol oxidase which binds it was normal compared to the second one. And that's why your smile extra worked beautifully in this patient. And you can see that what MAM showed when you do an extra, you can see the changes happening from softer to stiffer. And this shows that your eye is actually getting better. And this is a patient who had a weaker SSI to begin with. And uh, you can see that uh, the patient had a poor biomechanics. And this is where I wanted to see what is really happening and what we really, uh, again, uh, this was a smile surgery. And what we found here is that the collagen was low. So when you see that the collagen is low, it actually matches with your biomechanical changes. Basically, what I'm trying to say is we are trying to match with exactly what the machine is showing to what actually the patient has. I mean, it's a little difficult to uh, explain it in a short time, but it's basically trying to mix the cellular versus the, the molecular signatures. And, uh, and again, uh, when you do it on these corneas, you can see the change uh, after the extra, the smile extra, and you can see that it's becoming uh, much stiffer. So this is a complete picture. So that what many times we, when we look at it from one angle, sometimes we miss the picture and we have to probably see it from multiple directions. And uh, two things which really helped uh, is, uh, you know, there are different ways of analyzing this. This is one of the ways. I'll skip these slides. A new prototype of Corvus is coming, which looks at multi-zone. Uh, it's not just one zone. You're trying to look at multiple zones of, uh, you can look at the, the top, center, and down. So you can get deformation values from different zones. So what I'm trying to say in this is uh, biomechanics is a very integral part of a refractive surgery. It is complex. Sometimes as simple as an epithelium or a dry eye can mess up your understanding of it because you don't see what you, what you don't always see what you want to see. And because you had to put a little bit of an effort. So the cases I showed in the last uh, few minutes is exactly what, uh, what we should be looking at when you have those confusion. And uh, looking at com combination of 
biomechanics and uh, topography, I think, is the next new normal in the new future. And uh, all I showed was to prove that when you integrate, I mean, it's, it's just for research, we don't need to use all this to prove that the biomechanical measurements were actually telling you the truth, even though the topography or tomography was sometimes not telling you everything. So to prove that, I use the molecular signatures to prove that the molecular signatures, which had low collagen or low lysyl oxidase, actually showed as poor biomechanics. The future is uh, brillion or uh, differential corvus, we call it. We don't have a name. I'm using one of the prototype. I work with Oculus on this, where we're looking at corvus at different zones, and we're just collecting data. So hopefully, it should uh, come out in the future. I thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to uh, present our data. Thank you.